Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's career chat. I'm Krista Harmon. I am a workforce development consultant with the Kent Intermediate School District. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm also really happy to have Dr. Ken Marriott with us today. He is a doctor of dental surgery. Welcome, Dr. Marriott. Thank you for having me. So we love to learn about new jobs here at Career Chats, and we're excited to have you here. When you think about your, your high school journey, when you were 16 or 17, did you think you'd grow up to be a doctor of oral surgery? Uh, no, not quite. Um, when I was in high school, my first two years of high school, probably ninth and 10th grade at Dakota, um, were a little... <clears throat> I probably wasn't sure where to go with everything. My grades were very subpar, very middle of the road, B's and C's, and needed to, didn't have much direction. And then it kind of hit early junior year. I decided I probably should do something different, maybe go to college. And I was thinking more community college and still wasn't sure. Maybe thought about being an auto mechanic or anything along those lines. Um, ended up, you know, getting through the junior year and senior year and was accepted to a couple of colleges and went to the University of Michigan. I started that in 2002, so hard to believe that's 21 years ago. And then um, I did my first four years there of my bachelor's degree, which is a bachelor of science in neuroscience. And I think I'm probably just getting ahead of myself now. So, yeah, well, so you were you were like a lot of kids. You weren't thinking a lot about it in high school. You were an average student, like you were saying, but then you started kind of putting your mind around it. And the fact that you thought that you want to be an auto mechanic, were you good with your hands? Is it something that you had good manual dexterity and used to play with Legos and small items? Kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, I had Lincoln Logs. <laughs> I haven't known any fun Legos, but yeah, no, I'd, I'd like projects, like hands-on projects. I mean, a couple summers ago, I built a treehouse from scratch in my backyard, just drew it on paper and went from there. So I've got a fair imagination and some spatial awareness that that helps me do some creative things. But yeah, no, I just didn't have much direction. Um, a busy family, so you know, I stayed active in some activities. I was in the marching band, and I was pretty active in the Boy Scouts. I had a lot of friends there, and we like to do things outdoors. But no, I just never really gave it a ton of thought. And I think um, part of these conversations are when young people hear these different facets, they think, huh, I'm really, I like doing outdoor projects, you know, like I have an imagination, I like to build things. <laughs> so this is where some of those transferable skills that we have naturally, you know, can kind of come into careers. So auto mechanics is what you were kind of thought about, but it sounds like you went off to college and you chose neuroscience. So tell, tell us what was going on with your thinking that you chose that as a major. Yeah, the the first two years of college was basically since I got into college, I was well, well, I better put my foot down and start studying and, you know, paying all this money for it is a huge investment of your time and finances and a family investment. You really need to be responsible and be disciplined in school. So I put my head down and I studied quite a bit. I had a very heavy class load and I was trying to double major in biology and psychology um, just to, I thought healthcare would be a good idea. There's always need for healthcare workers. So there's always a job that's got a lot of job security. And I thought for at first, you know, maybe I could be a psychiatrist or something silly like that. I like to talk to people, got a fair personality sometimes. And um, so I started with biology and psychology classes and was trying to double major. Uh, eventually, my first year, they released a new degree called the uh, Bachelor's of Neuroscience. And I jumped onto that bandwagon because it just melded the two very well and lightened the class load slightly. Um, I was going to be taking summer classes as well on the double major track. And you know, I was uh, I was taking 18 credit hours every semester. It was a lot. So. That is a lot. That's a that's a big demand. So had you been interested in, was there something about the just people that you liked or the actual function of the brain at the time? Uh, you know, it just sounded interesting. Sounded so we just took some classes and biology was really intriguing me and the whole psychological aspect of things as far as there were some classes that were interesting called like drugs of addiction and pathology of neuroscience. It just it was intriguing to me the way that um, neurons can control everything you do. So I found it interesting. I started working in a research lab and got a little bit more exposure. Um, I don't like research at all. It's not for me. My wife does research and she can have it, keep it to herself. So I'm more of a people person, but yeah, just finding out how people tick and how you work. And it was interesting to me. That's awesome. So I love that experience. So you had in college around the research lab, cause you realized, no, this isn't for me. No, and that's absolutely not. That's part of what career development is. We try to help young people understand if they can watch some of these career chats and realize, mm -hmm. you know, that's not for me. That's okay. We just want to help give them the information to make those decisions. Absolutely. So as you approached your senior year then, um, did of you high school? With, yeah, of, of mm -hmm. college. Did you say this is what I want to do? Or is that the point so, where you started kind of going, huh? Something yeah, happened. so I was my, so my father is a retired dentist at this point, and he never really pushed the track. In fact, between 
the summers between semesters, I was looking for a job and I said, Hey dad, you know, can I work in your office? He said, no, you can go find a job. So I went and found a, I was a pool boy every summer in college. It was a lot of hard work outside and it was fine. It kept me busy. Um, in my second year of college, I think I was starting the summer semester, starting the summer break. Um, he was looking at a case that he was working on and it was a panoramic x-ray, which is an x-ray of your entire jaw. It's one that circles around your head. And he was, a, it was a cancer patient he had. And, you know, he's like, you know, I took this and we're sending him to a pathologist and yeah, we were just talking about the case and sparked some interest. And then I started researching, you know, was it take to get into dental school as far as requirements? Have I wasted any time? Am I checking the boxes? And just kind of set my head down that path. So it was kind of late second year of college. I decided to jump into dentistry. Fortunately, I had been taking classes that were leading up to preparation for it. So I was just yeah, a lucky it was break. in the healthcare environment, like you said, which you knew exactly. was going to be a good fit for you. Oh, yeah. And so that's kind of cool. It's interesting. Had your dad because my husband's a teacher and sometimes we discourage our kids or we don't make it really easy for them to go into the same path. Um, had you talked to your dad much about his job at that point prior to the, that year? You no, know, I really aggressively picked up after that point. But no, I knew he was a dentist and I knew he was, you know, a doctor and treated patients and he had his own office. So he had a lot of autonomy in his life, um, which was very attractive as far as a profession. I mean, I love that I own this practice. And if I decide, you know, I'm taking vacation next week, I could be very rude and cancel all my patients, but I could, I won't. But it's nice to have some autonomy and not being told what to do. And you have many people that look up to you and respect you as far as, you know, we have a problem here. How do we handle it? What are we doing here? So it's it's a lot of responsibility. And I, I thrive there. Yeah, I just want to encourage young people who are watching this, you know, to talk to the adults in your life about their careers. They're right there in front of you and they may have clues of things they like to do and don't do. So it's interesting, Dr. Mary, that here he'd been a dentist, but it wasn't necessarily on the radar. So you no, did no. that switch, yeah. So tell me um, how the rest of your schooling went then. Did you end up doing some like internships or clinicals? How does that training well, work? Well, it's, it's different now. Um, I'll go through it real quick. Um, I finished high school, um, didn't really shadow anywhere, just kind of got into college and started working hard. And then um, when I started out, decided to do dentistry, um, I mentioned it to my dad. I was, I was interested and he has friends that are dentists or oral surgeons or endodontists or prosthodontists, any of the people, any of the specialties we have in our field. And so I spent a few hours here or there just kind of shadowing, observing, asking questions. Um, I have a lot of students that shadow me here at my office now. Um, and some of them don't ask questions and it's very disheartening because they're not, they're not learning anything if they're not asking questions. So so I just did some, no internships, um, just did a, a little bit of observing. Um, nowadays, um, universities want quite a bit more observing kind of recorded. So that's where it's a little bit more aggressive. So it's part of the requirements to get some of the shadowing in and document it? Well, it's highly recommended. So, and when you get to that field where you have, you know, there's 120 seats and there's 3000 applicants, you need to, you need to show your interest. And that's one reason we love career chats, Dr. Marriott, because you're giving some insights that maybe a young person wouldn't know about, that these kind of experiences to shadow and document that, and show that you're interested and you're doing that stuff on your own time is how this game is, is played. You have to oh, be yeah. able to demonstrate that, whether it's in an essay or producing those records oh, of yeah. that kind of shadow. So that's, that's awesome. So shadowing was part of your, um, and we'll talk more about what students can do now, and I'll, I'll definitely come back to the ask questions piece, because that's, that's really <laughs> important. Um, so you graduate, so four-year degree then? Yeah, so four years now? degree as a bachelor's of science in neuroscience. And then um, my third year of undergrad, my junior year, you take a dental admissions test called the DAT. And that's kind of, the, you know, it's like the SAT in high school. So it's the, it's the bar that you need to pass to apply. And you need to get a, you know, they have score ranges that they find acceptable. And if they don't like it, you can redo the test. Um, I took that my third year and then applied the summer between junior and senior year in my undergrad years, um, hoping to get an interview in the fall term of your senior year and then jumping in the next year straight into dental school. Um, I'm not a big gap year fan um, as far as the students like to gap years between things. Um, I feel like you lose, forget how to study, forget how to work hard. It's just, and I'm more of a put your head down and get through it kind of guy. So, and I've talked to a few students that, you know, gap years have worked for. Um, if you need to take a gap year to maybe improve your CV or your, 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 you know, your reports, as far as your test scores, that's fine. But to take a gap year, in my opinion, just to take a break before you get serious is schools see that and they, they want to see what you're doing there that year. And if it's not impressive, they see it as a discouraging factor. That's really good to, to know that for sure. And it does sound like you are a put your head down kind of guy. So for you, <laughs> you wanted to keep going. Oh, How yeah. does one even choose what dental school they want to apply for or two? I believe there's there was there's 56 dental schools between the US and Canada. 
when you take your admissions test, the DAT, you're allowed to send it. At that time, you're allowed to send it to five schools. It was included in the, the fee for taking the test. And you can send it to as many schools as you like. Um, I tried to find regional schools to go to. So there was Michigan, University of Detroit Mercy. Those are the only two schools in this state. Then there's Marquette in Wisconsin, Indianapolis, and then uh, Case Western in Ohio. Those are the closest ones. So I just kind of stayed in the region. I'm a Midwest guy. So, And the out-of-state gets can be quite a bit more expensive than an in-state, just like it is with any college. So did they have, um, as part of the process, you submit your scores and do they do interviews? What is the rest yeah, of that so process look like? The, yep, so you, you apply, there's an essay, um, all the things that they want to see recorded as far as official transcripts and those documents. Um, if you pass the first round, then you get asked for an interview. And that's usually a day long process where they have you into the university. Um, you sit down with faculty, you sit down with other students and you're being evaluated at all aspects and they want to ask questions. And um, they even had a handwritten exam with pen and uh, pencil and paper at University of Michigan, which I hadn't done anywhere else. They sat you down for a half an hour and they wanted you to record on the random topic they proposed. So after the interview process, um, then it's selection time and there's early selection and then there's wait lists. And if you get wait listed, you're hoping someone says no and goes to a different school and you get called up or they, you know, then they reject you is the third step. So did you get through on that first try? Yes. So what is, are they looking for just scores then or what, what can students do to make sure they're the best candidate to, to we, that's a lot of candidates going for those positions. Yeah, well, they're looking for, you know, they want to see your transcripts. They want to see that you're studious, or at least if you're not, you know, it's a four-year transcript they're looking at. They want to see progression. They don't want to see a decline. You know, the, if you struggled in your first year getting your getting your feet wet, then they want to see, you know, you're not maintaining that. Maybe you're achieving more, progressing further, learning how to mature as a student. Um, then they want to see an essay reporting, you know, what your interests are. You want to see some shadowing. They want to see your, you know, static test scores. And the interview process is really, once you get there, that's where you win people over. Um, they want to see that you can have a conversation. I mean, I sit down with probably 60 patients a day and I need to have conversations with them. I need to make them feel comfortable. This is a very vulnerable place to be. Everyone's expecting bad things to happen. So you need to be able to communicate with people and they're looking for that in the interview process. Yeah. So after you graduate, you get into your dental school. Is that four more years? Yes. Yeah. A doctor of dental surgery is another four years. Um, and then if you want to specialize after that, um, there's, I think there's eight specialties now. I won't go through all of them, but they range anywhere from three years of additional education to six years of additional education. Yeah. And actually, this is something that I love about Career Chats is that we can help young people understand some of the jobs around you. So if you don't mind sharing those specialties, but then I'd like to hear just even who's part of your team, if they decide not to go all the way to a doctor of dental surgery, that they could still be in this industry because I'm sure you have some other really important support people around you. Yeah. So I'm a general practitioner. Um, then what's nice about that is a general dentist can practice any form of dentistry they'd like in any amount that they like. Uh, when you become a specialist, uh, for example, someone who's a prosthodontist, they work with prosthetics. They need to have 80% of their practice formed around prosthetics. They can't do root canals or little things like that that would mix up your day. They, they kind of pigeonhole into a certain topic. Um, as a general dentist, um, you can work for a company and be an employee, or you can own your own practice like I do. Um, then you have uh, your staff. I have 36 staff members. Um, there's front desks that answer phones, make appointments, and deal with the difficult conversations. Um, then I have dental hygienists that work on the people that clean your teeth. And we have dental assistants, and they assist the doctor through all their procedures and dismissing and helping with patients. And that's the general theme of the office. There's basically, you know, four departments, the doctor, the front desk, the assistants, so to the doctor, and then the hygienist. How did you know that the dental surgery is the route you want to go versus specializing in endodontry, being endodontist or the other uh, one that you just mentioned? How does, how was, does one decide? I was done with school. <laughs> I, I, had a, I had a point where I was okay. I was, yeah. I, I'm okay. Um, yeah. There, so the different specialists that there are, there's oral surgeons. Those are the ones that you know pull your wisdom teeth and they'll run pathology reports and do advanced surgeries. They can do facelifts, nose jobs, whatever you want. That they're they're basically uh, they go back to medical school after dental school. They do two more years in medical school, take those exams, and then go to a four year surgery residency. And uh, they're an impressive field. Then there's endodontists, and they focus on root canals. So if you have an infected nerve in your tooth, you go to them for treatment. Uh, there's orthodontists. They do your braces to make a beautiful smile. Uh, there's periodontists, and they're, they're the gum doctors if you have really bad gum disease. And there's a few other, there's a speech pathology uh, specialty now. There's, there's a few new ones popping up, but those are kind of the big hitters. 
Yeah, I love that, that you were able to be honest and say, you know, I'm done with school and that you get to do a, a wide variety of things. And that might appeal to people also versus um, my yeah. own son, like shadowed an endodontist. And it was just so narrow that that was a turnoff to him. Like he wanted yeah. to be able to do more. So yeah, exactly. Um, I also forgot there's pediatric dentists. So if you are someone who loves kids and wants to do that, that's a very challenging job, but there's a, there's a group of people out there that are good for it. So uh, but general dentist, you can do whatever you like. I, my day runs from doing an implant in the morning and a root canal after that to doing some ones Invisalign, then seeing some kids for their treatment. And it, it just runs a, it's a very mixed day. So it's, it's good. Is that something, yeah. Is, is that something you enjoy about it? The nice variety? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's nice to jump into different procedures, you know, kind of change the way things need to be done in your head. There's a different protocol and it just, you know, kind of keeps the day moving. So why don't you show us some of these um, pictures that you brought for us today, Dr. Marriott, and help young people as you share them, um, what the, that experience is like. Sure. Yeah, I did prepare, I prepared a small presentation. This is mostly going to focus around uh, surgery and implant therapy. And we can run through a few cases that I got lined up here because that's basically in my practice what um, what I focus on. I've got a master's in the International College of Oral Implantologists and then um, just got my fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry. So I like to like to get some credentials and do some advanced procedures. So you've continued learning, even though at that time you were done, but you have obviously are a lifelong learner. Yeah, yeah, just, I mean, like I said, I like to mix my day up with different things, and I, I don't want to do this, you know, even though it's mixed, I like to advance those procedures as we work through things, and things are always changing. Yeah, how, how does technology change? How has it impacted your profession as oh. you pull your slides up? Yeah, so, okay, let me, you want me to start the slideshow? Sure, just, okay. as you're pulling it up, just talk about technology maybe for a minute. Yeah, so um, when I started dental school, I've, there was very analog treatments. Um, we were taking film x-rays, and we still had to develop them in a developing room, a dark room. Um, now everything's digital x-rays, um, which are instantaneous and fantastic. Uh, my office tries to improve one piece of technology every year, so it's not too catastrophically financially burdensome. Because, you know, this stuff is it's a private office, and we pay for it, and it's expensive. So, um we use now, instead of taking regular x-rays, we could take 3D images, and I'll be able to show you one of those. It's uh, CBCTs, cone beam commuted tomography. And that's since 2017, the dent dentistry is allowed to have that in their office. Until then, it was only hospitals. So Very cool. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, we're excited to see those pictures. All right. Um, a couple quick cases here. Let's see. This was a patient of mine. She was in a car accident and lost three of her oh, front teeth. For some teeth. reason, I'm not seeing it. Let me, um, yeah, it's not popping up now. Let me see. At the bottom, the green button. Did you click that? Did I click the bottom green button? The share screen. Let me let me get out of this and see if I did. Hold on. One moment. Sure. There we go. Nope. Okay. Let's see. There we go. There you go. Are we better now? Yep. It's getting it's loading up. Okay. I'll just load the first slide again. Sorry, guys. I'm not a Zoom person. That's okay. So, so double click to enter full screen modes. Oop. So I don't know if that's you or me. Zoom click. Is there a double click? It says, My, it says that you're sharing a screen. I just don't see anything. I don't know if anyone else does. I assume not. We practiced before, didn't we? Oh, I just lost your sound. Okay, is that better? Okay, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, something something glitched. I'm not sure. So I'll okay. try and share, try to share the screen screen again. Yeah, so I found, find the screen I want. I could double click on that, right? Yep. Okay. Is that better? No, it's not showing yet. Oh, there it is. It's there. Yay. Okay. Let's we're good. Try okay. Are we good? Yep. All right. Forgive me. I'm not. I'm new to this. I actually You're tried. Yeah, I pra practice less. We can't do things in your office. We, you know, we, we can give some grace around the Zoom. <laughs> okay. So good still? Yep. All right. So this is a case uh, patient came in after her accident. She had lost three of her front teeth. I'm still seeing your, your main screen the, with the, the hiking boots on it. Let's try it one more time. Sound. <clears throat> I think if 
Yep, there you go. I can see the car accident photo now. Okay. All right, so let's try again. Hopefully it doesn't quit again. So this patient was in a car accident, lost three of her front teeth, and she came in, and when you lose teeth, the bone actually starts to atrophy or shrink. Um, so this is a case where we had, to, if we're going to replace these teeth, we would probably try and place some implants in here, but that can be challenging. Let's see. Okay. Are we good still? Yep, I can see the x-ray. All right. oh, good. Yeah, so this is one of our CBCTs. It's a 3D uh, image, and here we're looking at uh, the missing area of her front teeth that were lost. And if you were to move this in different directions, we'll be able to see there's really no bone um, present for these implants. And here's another angle of that. Um, this is the, we take these images and we start planning where we could place these implants. And we have, you know, this is our ridge or your lips way out here. And this is the roof of your mouth inside here. These thin little white lines are what we call a cortical plate. And that's the border of where your bone lives. Okay. So we're, we're looking at not a lot of bone in this area to place an implant. And over here is a sagittal cross section where we can see that outline where the bone is just very, very thin. We was that because of the car accident or her natural anatomy? Yeah. No, it's just the car accident. The teeth were lost and the, the bone did not heal well. Okay. Um, these little dark holes we see here are areas of nervous tissue. So we also can't just place implants in the middle of nerves because then you can't feel anything anymore. So this is just a little way we plan some of our treatment. Um, for this patient, these are the two implants we placed in this area trying to avoid that nerve. Um, we start an osteotomy, which is on the right side of the screen where we drill a small pilot hole. It's kind of like doing woodwork. Um, and these are zirconia implants that we placed. And this was her six months later. So we were able to get two implants in there and get some teeth in her mouth. So for her, this feel is to be the kind of physician that can just literally change somebody's life like that. Is that well, yeah, it's good. It goes from my last slide's a good one too, because this is more complicated. I've got a really simple one that really does a lot for people. But yeah, it's no, it's, it's it can be rewarding. It's also very stressful and challenging because it's you know, people are relying on you to give them teeth and you don't want to screw up. Right. So there's a lot yeah. of planning that goes into this. I can imagine. Um, this is another patient. They were hit in their front tooth by their child just playing around and they broke their front tooth off. So on the left side, you see the broken tooth where we're kind of missing it. And the, the right side screen is where the tooth has been taken out. There's a little socket there. So what we do then is again, place one of those implants in that socket that needs to heal for six months before a tooth goes on there. And that's what it looks like during placement. Uh, so the tooth comes out and that's the socket where the implant's being placed. And then that fuses to the bone in your body. So it never comes out or it's not planned to come out. Obviously trauma can happen, but it's meant to go in there permanently. Um, and this is that same patient six months later, the gum tissues healed pretty well. And then we were able to get a tooth on there in decent fashion. It's a little misaligned because his teeth are obviously fairly crooked, but this was a very acceptable treatment for him. Absolutely. And he doesn't let his kid hit him anymore. <laughs> Um, this is another patient where, again, we have someone who is just missing a front tooth their whole life. And what happened was he just never had that tooth. So the bone in this area just never developed. It really scoops in right here. And we can kind of see this thin ridge down here where the bone, again, very thin. And so what we do in this case is we're going to place an implant and then put some grafting in the area. So here's us during the surgery where we have good, healthy bone right in the middle right here. And then this big defect. So what we do is we're going to draw the patient's blood spin it in a centrifuge and take out something called platelet-rich fibrin, which is basically the red blood cells on the bottom we don't need. And then up top here is a fibrin mesh of stem cells, leukocytes, growth factors, all the stuff that helps you heal. And then we add some donated human bone and put it in that area and they heal very quickly. So these are just some of the fun different things that you can do. And this is obviously some of the stuff you learned even after dental school. Yes, this is, the, yeah, they don't, they don't teach you this in dental school, but, you know, I draw my own blood and I, you know, I, I do all this stuff myself. So that's something you pick up later. Yeah. Which is important for young people to hear because sometimes they're like, how, how do I learn this stuff? But a lot of it can be as you're in the job, just continue oh, yeah. to learn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, this patient was also hit in their front tooth. I can't remember what happened, but this front tooth right here, there's a fracture beneath, beneath the gum line. And with implants, once you put the implant in, the body needs to heal around it before you can use the tooth. But if, if things are done right, you can actually load the tooth, which means put a crown on the tooth that same day. So this was the tooth came out, the implant went in, and 20 minutes later, we have a tooth on that implant. Um, and then these are what the x-rays kind of look like. The tooth had fractured on the right side over here where this little screw ends in that tooth. And this is what an implant looks like. This is a titanium implant, and the temporary tooth is screwed into that. 
And then this is her when we're trying to do our final shade selection. So if you ever want to be something of an artist, this is a really fun part of it where you can really just really nerd out on how to, you know, make shade matching and colors and translucency and hue, value and chroma, just really get crazy about it. So. And about um, dentistry, that is really a good combination of people who are good with math and are also artists. So you're, you're agreeing with that. Oh, yeah. Um, this is another one, another trauma case. This, this on the right side, there's a little horizontal fracture running across the tooth. Um, yeah, it's this tooth right here. And so we did the same thing. We took the tooth out, implant went in right away. And the one on the right side is our final product. Um, and it looks great. The gum tissue healed perfectly and the color matching is great. The translucency and the light reflection looks great. So these are just some of the really fun things if you really wanna have fun with your work. This is, this is really rewarding to do for somebody. Absolutely. That's life-changing, like you said. How rewarding. Yeah. So um, is, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, when you look at those pictures, that's obviously some of the highlights of your career. What are some of the things that are either stressful or kind of your least favorite part of your job? Yeah. Well, nothing's perfect ever. So there can be times where, you know, you'll, you'll do something and maybe just cosmetically it's not working out or something breaks and you need to redo it. And, you know, something breaks after a year or something, you're going to redo that for free. You're not getting paid again. So, and you know, it's a private business and, you know, you can't just redo things over and over again. You need things to last and people depend on them and they expect them to last. The weird thing about dentistry is that everyone expects when you get a hip at a hospital, a new hip, they tell you they replace them every 10 years, but everyone thinks, you know, your crowns or fillings are going to last your lifetime. And honestly, they won't, they take a lot of abuse. So that's a frustrating part is that sometimes things just don't go well and you got to deal with the consequences and you got to deal with frustrated patients and your frustrations, and you need to be able to work together to get through it. So that's probably the hardest part there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, last slide I have, um, this is a, uh, God, he was, Eight years old, this boy, he's getting teased at school all the time and came in just in tears because he's got this genetic defect called amylogenesis imperfecta and the enamel just never developed properly. And so um, he was in tears and mom was upset. And in 20 minutes, I was able to just spiff him up a little bit so he can go to school and smile and not be teased by his friends. Wow. So what that's some of the- How, What did you do to, with, with his teeth? Magic wand. Wow. <laughs> We'll no, this is, these are, this is just composite fillings. You know, we kind of shave off some of the demineralized enamel and rebuild the tooth a little bit and bond it and polish it. And, you know, but something you can do in 20 minutes to change that kid's aspect on life and how he feels about himself is that's very rewarding. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So when you think about some of the um, characteristics, we have about three minutes left. I know you, uh, we want to keep you on track. Hmm. What are some of those characteristics that make a really good dentist? Oh, no, but you got to be able to talk to people. You need to be able to bite your lips sometimes when someone you need to listen to somebody if they're unhappy. You know, you can't just tell them they're wrong all the time, even though if you believe you're right, you know, it's like any relationship, there needs to be communication both ways. And I think, you know, the being able to communicate and then also just understanding your weaknesses and where you need to continue to learn and improve is something very important, like in any career. Yeah. So if young people are considering going into the dental field, what kind of word of wisdom would you like to give them? as they are still in high school and, and moving that direction? Well, if you're thinking about it at all, try and get some exposure. Um, and if you're going to shadow in an office, I had a shadow come in the other day and he started texting somebody in the middle of my room while I was working. So I had to kick him out. That's just unacceptable. It's not professional and it's nothing we want to see. So if you're ever interested, just go be respectful and ask a lot of questions. They'll, the, they'll appreciate it. They don't think you're interrupting them. So they know you're there. So they'd rather you just be involved. Yeah, I've heard that before, and I try to coach young people, too, and young people really hear this, what he's sharing, is that they're giving up their time, and I think sometimes young people, like, I don't want to bug him, you know, he's, he's working, and I don't want to bug him, but like you said earlier, if they're not asking questions, that's not a good use of your time, just to have nope. someone there watching you, so. Nope, that's not helpful for anybody, so, I mean, the shadowing is a, it's, a, it's inconvenient, but it's fine, we're doing it, because it needs to be done for our profession, and then it's also a slight invasion of privacy for our patients, so when I go in, I have to ask, is it okay that the student observes, and everyone says yes, but you need to be courteous of, of everybody's time that they're doing to help you observe, so ask questions, be respectful, and just be curious. Yeah, anything about um, dental school, just an inside tip, since you went through it? Get study groups? Do you have, did you partner with other people? Yeah, I mean, I, I lived in a house with eight other guys, and we were all in the same class, and we were a block away from school, so we could walk there. There's a lot of lab work you have to do in the evenings. There's a lot of studying. So, yeah, just, I mean, it's like anywhere, and, and even in high school, you find little groups that you can study with or ask questions and, you know, kind of work through things, and just, you know, it just, it's a lot of hard work. I mean, 
sometimes I felt like drinking water through a fire hose, but you know, you, you get through it. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And it sounds like you put your head down and you did it. And now you have this rewarding career with your own practice. And I know we did get to talk about that side of your owning your own um, practice, but I'm, okay. I think that's fantastic that you found your way. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate so, it. I appreciate yeah. you having me. And it was nice to be able to offer some advice or at least show something about the career. It's a nice profession. And, you know, honestly, it's very, it can be very rewarding. I never, never regretted it for a day. Well, I thank you for all that you do. I know my dentist is a very important person in my life to keep these curly whites uh, looking good with all the problems that I have. So thank yeah. you for, thank you for being with us today. No problem. Does anybody have any questions that I need to address? I think we're set. Okay. Well, thank you again. Appreciate your time and keep up the career paths. Thank you.